Right, so the extract by mask tool allows, uh, we could have um, just taken this uh, global polynomial interpolation uh, prediction raster, I guess is what they call it, and run it through this extract by mask and use the um, state boundary as our um, feature to mask the data, and then our output raster we would we would name and then set the coordinate system in the environments again. And that would have done the same thing as simply right clicking on it and exporting the layer to a raster. And this would be GA, which is geostatistical analyst layer to rasters. And then what we just did, right? So that's, those are your two ways to do it. So that's, that's working on that. So that is, Step seven in the uh, steps that we're working on. Um, yeah, that's actually step eight that we just did. So um, we're almost done with task one. And step nine, you can generate contours from the trend for data visualization just using the contour tool, which we've um, used before, but I guess we're going to use it for this uh, precipitation map. And that we're going to select this new raster that we got, and we're going to choose the name for it. And we're going to use 5 for the contour interval and 10 for the base contour. wonder why, well, um, the Idaho data probably has 10 as the lowest value, but New Mexico has 0 for the lowest uh, precipitation. So we're going to pick 0 for our base contour and click OK. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So in the Spatial Analyst Tools under Surface, we have Contour. Yep. And we're going to pick our new um, NMGPI, or it's that Geo um, Global Polynomial um, Interpolation raster that we just made. And we're going to set the contours. I don't know, we're going to name it NM Precip. Something. The interval we'll pick at 5. Base contour we'll leave at 0 because that's the lowest value we have. And the contour type for contour rather than polygons or shells or whatever. So those are just lines. And let's set the output coordinate system to the current map again, which is our custom New Mexico coordinate system, and run it. There we go. We can turn off the data. And what was the contour? Five. Yep. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, turning the raster back on, uh, you can see, well, we picked a different contour interval, right? Um, if we had picked the same interval as our symbology, which was 4, so what I can do is change the symbology of this to 5, right? So we could go through and pick not a geometric interval, well, actually... Let's set this to, well, we're not going to match it exactly. I guess if we um, divide the two, right? So it goes from 0 to, there's some negative numbers also because you have a polynomial of, negative, of 5, which allows the bends to go below 0 sometimes. So that's not exactly accurate. Can't it really have, maybe you can have negative rainfall. I mean, that's kind of an evaporative index or something. But anyway, if I take 0 to 30 and divide it by 5, I could say 6 intervals and then change the upper values to values of multiples of 5. Yeah. Yep. 
sometimes you have to start at the top. It's probably easier to start at the top because, like, when I got to 15, or actually 10, it was actually higher than the third one, which it didn't let you do or whatever. So um, doing this matches the colors of the ISO hit map to the contours, right? See how they match now? So that's one way to, to do it. So yeah, let's make a new map, right? Call it task two, I guess. I guess we can name this one task one, huh? Or just an uh, NM per set or something. Okay. This one we're going to add from our class data. Hang on. So now after copying that in there, I would refresh this folder and I should see the deer shape file that I can drag into the map. Those are deer sightings according to the step two. That's all we need. So we're going to use a kernel density estimation method to compute the average per hectare, deer sightings per hectare. Um, these are in a grid of 50 meters. Therefore, some locations have multiple sightings, so I guess if it gets a sighting, it's going to put it on the same location if it's close enough. Anyway, um, we've already done this part. So what's the value range of these sightings? That would be our first thing to look at. So perhaps we can open the attribute table, close some of this other stuff here. It's in the class data folder. Yep. And you have to refresh it. Yeah, so it looks like um, I could, well, yeah, I've already given it away. So sort of sending starts at one, right? The, at least one and as high as 15. As far as sightings go, right? Sounds good. Answers that question. Okay, so we're going to use the kernel density tool in the spatial analyst tools density tool set. Let's see where that is. Geoprocessing. Yeah, we could do a search for it, but I like to find it the other way. So, um, spatial analyst density, kernel density. Did everybody find that? It might be up here. Well, I don't think it would be up here. Um, so, it is in the spatial analyst tools under density, the density drawer in the spatial analyst toolbox. Kernel density. Ooh. Okay, so the input points are the deer uh, sightings. I'm not sure which fields that we're actually looking at. So, sightings for the population field. Oh yeah, we just saw that. So the sightings are the actual number of sightings. So and the output raster. Make sure it's going into your your default geo database, but. Yeah, that's fine. We can call it kernel deer. Any specifics for the output cell size? Doesn't look like it. We're going to use hectares for the um, area units. Um, 100 for the output cell size and 100 for the search radius. And the area units, hectares. Okay, I think the rest of it is good.
Sound good? We don't have to worry about the output coordinate system. It's just going to pick whatever. Yeah, let's go ahead and run that. Okay. What do you get for a range values for this kernel density? Fair enough, zero to like 29. Okay. Great, good job. <laughs> um, we talked about the kernel density, right? That's kind of a, was it an algorithm to apply yeah, to? Okay. Yeah. Right. It, it allows you to specify how the data is changing a little more with a little more um, control over it. So, all right. So for task three, we'll add a task three map and add stations and the ID out grid, which is a raster of the ID uh, Idaho. So new map, task three. That. And we're going to add the Idaho raster outline. And we're using stations again. Hmm. So, should we use the New Mexico one then, since these are the weather stations? Yeah, let's do. So I'm going to just go back to, we may use this for another one so we can rename it. So let's go back to our original map, our NM preset map, open that one. We can close some of these. Um, yeah, so here are the stations and the outline again. So we can just use this and then follow those instructions for Idaho. Okay, so we're going to go back to that wizard and choose instead of the global polynomial in, uh, in interpolation, we're going to use the inverse distance weighting, right? So the further something is away, the less it'll be weighted, and we can choose the power for that weighting also. So if we select the uh, analysis ribbon with uh, the station selected, you can go right to, does everybody see where the geostatistical wizard is? Our stations point, yeah. And then go to the analysis ribbon. And then you should see that geostatistical wizard. Yep. And this time we're going to choose inverse distance weighting. Same source data set, same data field, the uh, uh, total precipitation for that. And next. A lot different than the global polynomial in, uh, <laughs> index one or whatever, or the interpolation. So, okay. That gets us to step. Oh, uh, step two includes graphic frame and the method. Uh, the default method uses a power of two, maximum of 15 neighbors or stations around it, a minimum of 10 neighbors, and one sector area from which control points are selected. The graphic frame shows stations and the points and their weights. You can click on more general more in the general properties frame to see the explanations used in the driving estimated. So we can use the identify tool to click any point within the graphic frame and see how the points predict value is derived. Well, let's see about that. Well, I don't know that there is one here.
Well, it does show the weight of that point around it, right? So um, we pick a point, shows you the neighbors, the point and its neighbors around it, does it? It doesn't look like it has that in identify tool in there. <clears throat> but just by clicking on it, it does show the result for the x and y value and its predicted uh, precipitation. So I guess that's the default. Fair enough. Okay, uh, there is a button that um, allows you to optimize the power um, value. So um, let's see what that does. This little button right here, you can click on next to in the power type in. You can pick your own power, right? From 0 to 100 or something. 1 to 100. 0 would just be a straight line, I guess. But anyway, you click to optimize. Oh, it went to a power of 1. That's cool. In Idaho, it's a value of 3.191, but um, using what's called cross-validation. Remember what cross-validation meant? That is. It basically takes a point out, and it runs the tool without a certain data point, and then it compares that data point that wasn't involved in the whole interpolation and compares it with what it got. So if I, you know, like around here, there's lots of stations. So if I leave out like this station right here, that station right there, and I run the tool, like it wouldn't change the tool too much, right? But then I could, I could look at that value of the one I left out and compare it with what the value would be or what the value is predicted to be over that point and compare them. And that's how you can get some um, error measuring going on. Step three, anyway, allows us to cross-validate, um, well, examine the um, RMS values here. So if I go next, with a power of 1, it looks like I have a root mean square of 3.6. Well, let's go back and just kind of pretend we didn't see that and go to power of 2. And then go next, and that's at 3.85. So power of 1 went to 3.6, so it got a little higher, right? What if I go to power of 25? That's crazy. And I'm up in the 4s as far as my root mean square. So I don't have a lot of hope <laughs> getting much better than that, right? Yeah, I'm in the 4s. Even at 5, I'm at 4. Uh, root mean square. Not looking too much better. So you're getting you're getting more details and stuff where you might like carve out mountains and things and make it look better, but it yeah that seems to work the best. All right, so you can um, click Finish and look at the method report and follow the um, same steps to get, yeah, might as well, right? So we can click Finish. Here's our report. It's wonderful. I left it at 1. Yeah. You know, I bet we could do better, though, because we have some other stations that are just way out there. So what if we reduce the minimum number of neighbors to, like, four or something? Maybe even less than that. But let's just see if that gets us a better 
root mean square, so 3.63. I think that was actually better. Was it? Or was that? Nope. It didn't change it. Okay, well, never mind. Yeah, it doesn't change anything anyhow. I, I thought it would because then it wouldn't be taking so many neighbors like far away, like these remote points, and then picking neighbors so far away. But it uh, doesn't seem to help much. Okay. Well, anyway, let's finish and OK. And then that adds a new uh, geo -anal geostatistical analyst layer. And we can right click it and export it out to raster. And we should name it NMIDW or something. Output cell size, same. It's all good. Environment, scoring system, our current one. And we're going to mask it, right? So we're going to mask the based on the state outline. And is that right? Well, yeah, it says US states, but it's really just the New Mexico outline, so. There we go. Maybe turn off some of this other stuff. So it fits it. Well, it clips it to the boundary anyway, even though it doesn't fill the rest of it because there's no weather stations down in the good old panhandle there. Nobody lives. I left it at 2200. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, we'll do this again with Krigging, which is sort of a hybrid of deterministic and stochastic methods that we kind of talked about. Um, I, I'm going to leave it in the same same task. We're not going to add another map. Um, yeah, we we don't have that. Uh, explore data tool anymore. Um, I wonder if we can find that um, semi variogram uh, cloud tool somewhere. So let's see if we can find that. Okay, so let's turn everything off but the points in the state outline again. And we'll go to the geostatistical wizard and we'll choose Krigging, co Krigging, right? And the same uh, weather stations and the total precipitation field. We're okay with that. We'll leave all that um, uh, the way it is. Oh, and leave it on prediction. So that's fine. Probability would be the next most interesting. Um, there's the density function and yeah let's go next to our yeah uh, if we go to the fourth page I guess that is or the third it's the third or fourth Anyway, this is our semi-variogram, which plots the differences between the pairs of points. And we can change the number of um, parameters in here, right? The, the lags and the, those are what they used to call bins, I believe. So. Well, it's actually the lags in the bins used to bin the empirical. I guess those are bins. Used to be called bins. Leave that at 12. 
we can optimize the model, which I'm guessing is already there's it wasn't already optimized. So let's go next for so it seems to be following this trend line, you know, with some variance there, but I do think you can edit the sector types. You can do a uh, octant. There's our octant one that we talked about too. Don't know that. Well, yeah. Um, the next screen should give us our average root mean square error, right? Um, yeah, that's not much better than the inverse distance weighted. In fact, it's a little worse. Yeah. That's as good as it's going to get, unless... Yeah, you're going to get more errors out, you know, where it's remote. So I think that's as good as we're going to get. All right, let's finish. This one, well, I'm going to click on Optimize again just in case I mess something up. But I don't think it was different. We'll finish that, and we already saw our root mean square error and all the settings in there. I believe you can export this. Yeah, or copy it. Anyway, click OK. And now we have this model that we can export, but I think I'll leave it because we've already done that. Yeah, everything else is off, so that, that's our model. Kind of got ahead of us, ahead of this. Uh, let's just run through the task a little bit and make sure we didn't miss something important, but I think that's it. Yeah, so in the, um, I guess we could have paid more attention to that semi variegated cloud, but um, I don't know. Did that let you, we can look at this again. Next, next, next. Yeah, and here, um, can we click on anything? It didn't look like we could. No. So it's a little less functional than it used to be. Okay, so that we're going to have to pass up on some of that. We can, though, um, probably zoom in on um, the distance range. Yeah, we can change some of these values, and Idaho has a similar size as New Mexico as far as its width and height. So, as far as this rectangular width and height bounding box area, I guess. So, if we pick uh, 200,000 meters and the lag size to 10,000, let's see what that does. Well, no, because we can just run through this again, just get there. We don't have to make a new map. Just get to this ceramogram, and here's the cove. Uh, I think we want. Well, that doesn't help either. semi variogram right? Yeah. Okay. So, lag size was 10,000? Let's go 10,000 on this. 
Number of lags, 20. And it's kind of hard to tell where it starts leveling off. I mean, a lot of this is pretty level for quite a bit. So, um, and this is uh, by 10,000 meters, 100,000 meters. So we're looking at 90,000 meters here. There's 100,000 meters. So yeah, not too different than Idaho's map for the, because they were at like 125,000. Meters started to level off. Anyway, it will switch the lag size to 82,000. And now we got something weird. Lags to 12. Yeah, we can't do this interactive stuff. Are you on semi-variogram or covariance? Okay, and you have 82,000 and 12. Do you have any points selected in your map? Hmm. But you don't see any... Okay, let's go back to here, to the beginning, and you are you definitely have Kriging, well, yeah, you wouldn't see those other charts if you didn't, but the source data set is your, uh, what you call it, your stations, and the data field is your total <coughs> precipitation, hmm. and you didn't change anything here. Nothing here. Try uh, hitting optimize model first. There's a uh, there's a button at the top. Yeah. Did that put up the dots now? Okay. So right now it's at twelve thousand, right? Okay. It's sort of important, I guess, to do the error map. So if we step back here, we can do pr prediction standard error. So we've chosen Krigging, co Krigging, but instead of prediction, we can do. Um, Prediction standard error. I think that's what we're looking to do here. Yeah, so we can um, go back and produce another map. Like this. All right. Step. So this brings us to, I guess, in. Um, Task four, we're looking at step da, 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 eight. Or wait, we're we're in step five now, right? No, this is ordinary creating. Then we'll use universal creating. Ah, I just was reading the wrong part. Okay, so. <laughs>
Yeah, and we're just going to repeat the steps. Let's see, after all that. Okay. So go back here. Go through this window. So the only difference here is, um, in case we missed it, we're doing the same krigging, co krigging, and we're going to use prediction standard error. Glad I went back there because it changed it. And then next, and next, and optimize the model again, which puts it at that, and then next. So here's where the errors are, right? And so we kind of figured where there's fewer, where there's bigger spacing, and it looks like you have higher values and fewer stations, I guess. And we have low uh, error where there's just a group of stations and much more error where there's not. Um, not exclusively, though. We have some points out here that are uh, pretty far away, and the error seems to be pretty low, so I don't know why that necessarily is. But we can look... The root mean square is again 3.68, and let's finish that, and we'll add this to the map. So here's an error map that can be used to I don't know, quantify or qualify some of this data. Cool. I'm not going to trim it or clip it and export it out to a raster or whatever, but... Jump back to, I think we can finish task five before we get to our challenge task, which we would hit on Tuesday, I guess, or Monday. Okay, same, we're going to keep in the same task. We're going to run a universal krigging on this data, and we'll follow the wizard. And... First, from the order of trend removal, oh yeah, that would be one step we hadn't done, so geostatistical wizard, universal krigging, are we, yeah, where is that? So yeah, it's actually on the next page. So we're going to use regular krigging, co-krigging, and next. Well, make sure that, I mean, we already have that. That shouldn't change, right? So your weather stations and your precipitation. And then under the krigging, you can use universal and prediction. Pretty sure that's what we're going to be doing. Um, yeah. Prediction for the output type. And we're going to pick first order from the order of trend. Next. So here's the first order. Step three shows the, the trend that will be removed from the Krigging process. And we'll click next in the fourth step panel. Click the button to optimize it, next, next, and look at the URMS. So optimize. Wow, it did quite a bit. So um, yeah. Okay, next. And you get your semi-variogram, that's that's great. Next. And next. So that's not helping our root mean square error. So inverse distance weighted takes the cake so far. Okay, and then we just add that to our map, and that's uh, all it is. So using these different methods, I mean, if you sum, sum up, there's a lot of settings in these in these krigging um, exercises that changing the number of sectors. Um, for a whole precipitation over a whole state, I can't think that any increase in this is going to help much, just because the data's kind of clustered in one place and not clustered in another, and the values are skewed to the right anyway. So it tried to remove that with the, with the trend removal, which was back here. Well, if we optimized it. so.
good. So yeah, it had to pick a huge radius for this. Uh, well, to to get enough neighbors. All right, good enough. So if we finish, we can add it to the map. I guess we should do that. So here's our universal creaking one. Yeah, that's the one on top. Then we could export that if we wanted, but that's it.